Dear respected friends, thank you very much for this invitation to speak this evening. It's uh, as we just heard a very important theme that we have a discussion protecting civilians in the line of fire. Looking at it from the Catholic religious point of view, we begin looking at the scriptures where God tells us of man as regards his fellow man, I shall demand account for human life. Again, we read in Exodus, you shall not kill. And Jesus says, affirming Exodus, you shall not kill, the words from the 10 words, the Decalogue, he goes further and says that even anger that leads to killing your fellow man is immoral. And then God tells us also in Exodus, do not cause the death of the innocent or the upright. So with such clear statements in the scriptures, it's quite strange that we have a situation in the world today where civilians are facing such great difficulties. So many civilians are being killed. And in that context, I would like to congratulate INSS uh, for organizing this program and especially looking at it from the theological and religious point of view. In our world today, which is afflicted by wars between states, between groups within states because of terrorism. We have a situation with the UN recognizes where it says civilians constitute the vast majority of casualties in situations of armed conflict. We should not think of civilian suffering as a simple side effect of war because in the war today, civilians are being directly made targets on the one hand. On another side, we have also situations where civilians become a human shield for groups that are attacking another group, whether it be the state or non-state groups. When we speak of civilians in the line of fire, we must also understand that includes, it includes especially suffering for women. And the many reports from the UN speak of systematic and widespread sexual violence reaching appalling levels of brutality. Other people who are involved particularly are children, people with disabilities, old people. And then connected to this, we have the situation of refugees. And Apart from refugees, very similar situation, internally displaced persons. Once again, the UN reports that the vast majority of internally displaced persons in the world today affected by armed conflicts are civilians. Then we have constraints on humanitarian access and even direct attacks on humanitarian personnel and the resources that are available. Another thing that we may not immediately notice is the effect of armed conflicts on poverty. The UN recognizes this when in its Millennium Declaration, which it saw the connection between poverty, peace, and development. And in the Millennium Declaration, it says we need to take care of civilians caught in the line of fire. Another thing that the UN notices is that violence against civilians is today recognized as the threat to international peace and security. We know violence leads to further violence, and therefore it does not lead to any solution but further suffering for people, especially civilians in the modern style of warfare that we have. Since we have reached a stage where civilian suffering is so much, in 2000, John Paul II, referring to this situation, said, all too many and horrifying are the macabre scenarios 
in which innocent children, women, unarmed old people have become intentional targets in the bloody conflicts of our time. And he called for uh, action. The moment has come to change direction decisively and with a great sense of responsibility. And therefore, the Catholic Church is very eager to join with the United Nations, with every nation that is keen to take up this issue of defense of the civilians. Already at the Vatican II, it was noticed that any action, whether it be led by the UN, by nations, groups, NGOs, religions, it should look at human brotherhood, the inherent dignity of all human beings, and solidarity as the central values in the process of trying to find ways to defend the civilians. And so the Vatican document, which is very important for the church, or let's say the most, or the highest authority for us, says a firm determination to respect other men and peoples and their dignity, as well as the studied practice of brotherhood are absolutely necessary for the establishment of peace. Without it, we will not have peace, and the UN, as we said, sees a threat to peace in this situation of attacks against civilians. So we have the values of brotherhood of all human beings, equal dignity of all human beings, which leads to understand the sacredness of human life. And that gives rise to what we started with, you shall not kill the command that God has given us. Now, to understand further the Catholic perspective on placing civilians in the line of fire, we would look at three core beliefs, convictions that the church has. The equal dignity of all human beings, and therefore the sacredness that follows from it, the right and duty to defend the life and common good from just unjust aggressors, and the permanent validity of the moral law which forbids murder. We look at each of them. First, all human beings are equal in dignity and their life is sacred. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of with which we are very familiar, says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Of course, theoreticians on the question of human rights have raised the question, where do we found this brotherhood? Where do we found this equal dignity? We have a statement but there's not much explanation as to from where this brotherhood comes. But from the religious point of view, it's very clear. So we found this brotherhood in the creation, in the image of God. We are said, we are told God created man in the image of himself. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And the dignity of the human being is so much that the Psalms will tell us, yet you have made him little less than a god, you have crowned him with glory and beauty, made him lord of the works of your hands, put all things under his feet. Then, in addition to creation in that image of God, Christians believe in the incarnation of God as a human being, which valorizes our human dignity. Further, it is Christ, according to Christian belief, who redeems with his own blood human beings, and therefore the value of the human being. And then we are all guided to a final end in eternity when we will be united with God. So created in the image of God, redeemed by God, and destined to be united with God gives us our dignity, and therefore what is referred to as CCC is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is a very definitive teaching. It says human life is sacred because from the beginning it involves the creative action of God. It remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator, who is their sole end. And therefore, God alone 
he is the lord of life which is the title of the presentation that we are making today the sacred of, of life therefore for the church implies prohibitions against any direct murder anything that we do indirectly to bring about the death of another person even refusing assistance to persons in danger of death terrorism kidnapping hostage taking and even anger that reaches a point of deliberate desire to kill or seriously wound a neighbor now we come to the fact that given the situation of cain and abel that the actual situation in the world while we speak of the great dignity of life is that there are people who are unjust and who are aggressors and who want to take the life of his brother and therefore we need to have a right to defend ourselves when we are attacked or when someone else is attacked and so the church recognizes this right a right a legitimate right once every means of peaceful settlement has been exhausted that condition is important and that's why i put the the warning that conditions do apply this right to defend ourselves can become a duty and a grave duty when people are interested to us so for a government its citizens defending them is a grave duty a father of a family defending the family is a grave duty not only really a right to defend itself and from this follows the possibility for states to put an obligation for national defense on its citizens and in this context gaudi mespas again from the vatican 2 says soldiers and all who devote themselves to military service of their country are agents of security and freedom of peoples and when they carry it out in the right way they genuinely contribute to the establishment of peace in order to exercise this defense as gandhi would say the great river ganges of rights flows from the himalaya of duties i come from india by the way so gandhi um, strict conditions for uh, legitimacy are involved first of all all these conditions should be present simultaneously for just war the damage inflicted should be real grave certain all other means should have been tried and found impractical or ineffective there must be serious prospects of success and the use of arms must not produce greater evil than the one that we are already suffering then we realize that given the kind of warfare that we engage in today there is hardly any situation where we can today speak of just war and therefore the church says we are all called to engage ourselves in prayer and action in order to avoid avoid the ancient bondage of war while we speak of dignity of life the right to defend ourselves we have a third aspect that the command not to kill does not go away because of the right to defend ourselves because the command not to commit murder is perennial it's universally valid it obliges each and every one always and everywhere and therefore the church says the mere fact that war has regrettably broken out does not mean that everything becomes illicit between the warring parties and christ is an example of who does not use this right to defend himself so the catechism stipulates this would mean that we should have tremendous respect for non combatants wounded soldiers prisoners we should condemn as grave crimes and sins extermination of a people nation or ethnic minorities the indiscriminate destruction of whole cities or vast areas with their inhabitants it also would mean that the law that god has given us is translated into our rational capacity which recognizes these laws in nature which we would refer to as natural law so we recognize with our reason not only really people of religion any human being that there exists inalienable human rights connected to our being one human family our human nature 
This gave rise to the Geneva Conventions, 1949, which we understand our former Pope Benedict speaks of it as the minimum standards that should be maintained when violence has erupted. Now, the conclusions that follow from these three convictions, first of all, the brotherhood of all human beings, equal exalted dignity of all human beings, the legitimate right to defend ourselves, at the same time, the moral law that continues to remain even when we have the right to defend ourselves. And so in no kind of conflict is it permissible to ignore the right of civilians to safety. The dignity and the right of individuals should be always respected. They are to be accepted as prior and superior to any kind of difference or distinction, whether it be racial, whether it be national, whatever distinctions that we can speak of. Human rights are universal and indivisible, and therefore they have no borders. And hence it becomes the duty of each one of us as human members of the human family, and particularly of the international society. Now, how does the church contribute to the defense of civilians suffering from armed conflicts? First of all, it's a signatory to the Geneva Conventions, which the church sees as the basis for the legal framework for the protection of civilians in armed conflict. And therefore, we will not uh, define ourselves who is a civilian in a situation of conflict, but we will depend on the international law. We also recognize that the state is the one most responsible directly to defend its citizens, and the parties in a conflict are responsible for not causing suffering to the civilians. The church itself highlights humanitarian access, special protection of women and children, disarmament, but also supports the, uh, the things that the UN has seen as the important challenges in this context. We would like to look at the support and promotion given to international humanitarian law by the church. Interna international humanitarian law ought to be considered as one of the finest and most effective expressions of the intrinsic demands of the truth of, fee of peace. And Job, uh, Pope John Paul said, all conflict situations should be carried out in full respect for international law guaranteed by an authority that is internationally recognized. Today we refer to it as the UN, UNO. We, of course, then try to build a culture of peace, providing, a huma providing humanitarian service in which the church is very much involved, trying to prevent violence rather than trying to solve issues, education to peace, and especially education to peace for young people, and overcoming fundamentalism and nihilism may be a point that we could stop on because of the special attention. I still have two, three minutes, right? Okay. Uh, uh, Pope Benedict especially spoke about this fundamentalism and nihilism. Nihilism, according to him, does not believe or trust in objective laws of the dignity of the human being, of the great future that await the human being. And therefore, they have no, nothing to believe in, and that leads to terrorism. Where nothing positive is hoped for, the suffering is seen, but it is taken as a no-return situation. The same thing, he says, can happen also with religion when it becomes fundamentalism. That we have a truth in sight which we want to tell the others about, but that is part of religion. But what happens when it becomes fundamentalism? We have a truth in sight, we impose it on the others. Then it becomes fundamentalism, changing from being simple, pure religion. And that also is a cause of a lot of problems in the world today. To conclude, sacredness of life naturally leads to a stand of nonviolence for the church. I'd like to use John Paul's words, Violence is evil, violence is unacceptable as a solution to problems. Our problems are great. Violence is unworthy of man. It is a lie, for it goes against the truth of our faith, the truth of our humanity. 
it destroys what we claim to defend. I think this will be the crux of the discussions that will come. The pursuit of the common good of a single political community cannot be in conflict with the common good of humanity. And this common good of humanity is what we refer to in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And genuine patriotism of any nation, of any group, cannot be the fruit of jealousy, competition, suspicion, desire for power or hatred. Genuine patriotism has to be the result of love of country, common desire for the good, fraternal trust, harmonious cooperation, respect and protection for all human rights, including and especially those of the weak and the small. And therefore, we would put together the message of the church in this situation. Not every means is justified in legitimate defense. This, of course, becomes all the more difficult for organized groups, for nations, when they are fighting groups that don't seem to respect any of these ethical principles. I'd like to draw our attention to another, another teaching from Gandhi. When a reader reading Gandhi's articles, which said, means and the ends are connected like the seed and the tree, the reader said, this is not true. Gandhi's response was this, and he gives this example. He said, you see a nice wristwatch on a man. You want to have it. You want to possess that. If you want to take it from him, you would have to fight him. Another way to get this watch is to buy it from him. If you want to buy it from him, you would have to work hard to make your money. A third way is to steal it from him. In all three cases, you have the watch. But in the first case, it is not really yours because it is taken by violence. You have fought him. In the second case, it is your own because you have bought it. In the third case, again, it is stolen property. It's not yours. And with this, he gave a clear example of how means and ends are connected. And therefore, while we hold the importance of the value of the high dignity of the human being, and hence to that we need to recognize brotherhood, respect sanctity of life, defend human rights, promote the dignity of each human person. This translates as a clear stand in defense of the rights of the civilians who are caught in the line of fire. And this the church exercises by respect for humanitarian law and a commitment to humanitarian aid. Thank you very much.